Welcome to Liberty Now! Woo! That's known as the voice of God self-introduction from, or flying spaghetti monster, from the backstage area. Welcome to the presidential debate at the Libertarian Party of Texas's 2016 state convention. You guys fired up? All right. Well, enough about me. Let's get started. I'm going to introduce our moderators for the evening. First up, we have Jack Spinkle. Many of you know Jax, give her a shout out, yay. Jax is the executive director of Texas Normal, the Austin chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. She's been involved in cannabis laws since 19, oh, 2005. Oh, sorry, sorry, 2005, made you older than you were. That was me saying 1900. In her tenure, Jax has given hundreds of interviews and participated in panel discussions and speaking engagements. She innovated the first ever Cannabis-Centric Voter's Guide in 2012 and continues to prepare the, for the Texas Normal Voter's Guides each election season. Welcome, Jack Spinkle. <laughs> Our second moderator is well known to most of you in this room. Michael Bodnarek is a philosopher, author, iconoclast, I love that word, and political agitator. He began studying the Constitution in 1982 and quickly realized that most of what our government is, do, does is, guess what? Unconstitutional. <laughs> he considers this unconscionable and totally unacceptable. He was our 2004 Libertarian nominee for President of the United States. He uh, has recently returned to live permanently in the great state of Texas. Oh wait, it gets better. He plans to die in Texas with his boots on, with his, with his smoking gun in his hand, if necessary. Give it up for Mike Bonarek. <laughs> and now for the millennial portion of our program, we have Ben Farmer. He is the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Texas. Give it up for Ben. He is the host of the Voice of Reason radio show on 89.1, uh, I'm sorry, FNM in Austin, graduate of Odessa Permian High School and the University of Texas of the Permian Basin with a BA in political science and history. And you're going to explain to us what the heck is going on behind you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for that great introduction there, Ed. So this big monstrosity behind me right here is the Liberty Now Command Center, brought to us by our friends at Signal Labs and ATX Event Systems. What this is doing is looking out over the internet in real time, and you can see how Clayton is, is manipulating the pictures up there. So I'm going to ask you guys to do something that you're almost never going to hear at a live performance, and that is to take your phones out and turn them on. Please be polite and turn your flashes off. However, we do want you tweeting about this. We want you Facebooking about this. We want you blogging about it. And remember to use the, the favorite hashtags from the candidate you want to ask a question from, and remember to use our hashtag, which is hashtag Liberty Now, and you'll be able to see your stuff going up here in real time. We'll be able to gauge what the whole internet is thinking right now. And the person who's gonna take your text message question, you got that little yellow sheet of paper? All right, good. The guy who's gonna be taking those text message questions for, from you is this gentleman right here, Mr. Michael Armand. I'll turn it over to him. All right. <laughs> So in order to send a question, you're going to send the text to 22333. But before you actually ask your question, you're going to have to type in the code that is right beneath that, which is 136092. So, all right. <laughs> okay. So in order, you're going to be sending the text to the number 2233. And then and before you ask your question that you would like to ask, you want to type in the code that's beneath that, which is 136092, and then you type in your question. Great, thanks, Michael. And I just want to point out that this is exactly the kind of thing that we have been doing in the party over the last couple of years, is to make sure that people understand that we are the party of the 21st century. <laughs> and we will use the creative application of technology to show the rest of the world that the libertarians are coming, baby. And we will use the creative application of technology to show maybe undecided voters in the state of Texas that we are the party of the 21st century. 
And we will use the creative application of new technology to show the rest of the world that we want liberty now. We want it right now, and that's what this weekend is about. Let's do it. All right, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Michael. So hashtag Liberty Now. There's also some of you I know are also using hashtag LP Debate if it's specifically about the debate, but we want you to push that Liberty Now in order to get on the big board over there. Right? So hashtag Liberty Now. Now to introduce the candidates for tonight's event. As one of his primary campaign reforms, Mark Feldman seeks to bring transparency to government and encourage voters not to support candidates by backed by big money. He is a member of Stop Mass Incarceration of Greater Cleveland and has served as its president of the Ophthalmological Anesthesia Society. Give it up for Mark Feldman. Shauna Joy Sterling is a non-fee pastoral counselor. She has a BA in religious studies and a BA in psychology and an emphasis on school psychology, an MA in educational psychology, additional coursework in rehabilitation counseling and working with families with military, uh, with military backgrounds. Sterling is running for president of the United States to protect and defend the United States Constitution and the rights of the people to live in peace and freedom. Welcome, Shauna Joy Sterling. Governor Gary Johnson, who has been referred to as the most fiscally conservative go governor in the country, was the Republican governor of New Mexico from 1994 until 2003. A successful businessman before running for governor of New Mexico, he brings a distinctively business-like mental uh, mentality to governing, believing that public policy decisions should be based on costs and benefits rather than strict ideology. Welcome, Governor Johnson. Austin Peterson is a constitutional libertarian who believes in economic freedom and personal liberty. Peterson's passion for limited government led him to a job with the Libertarian National Committee in 2008 and then eventually to the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. After fighting for liberty at our nation's capital, Peterson took a job as associate producer for the Judge Andrew Napolitano Freedom Works show on Fox Business News. Welcome, Austin Peterson. <laughs> And last, by only the draw, well, with the technology being at the heart of his personal success, John McAfee and his campaign have taken on uh, privacy as their main campaign focus. He has authored several books on yoga, been featured in several publications on technology and privacy, and founded several development companies. Welcome, Mr. John McAfee. And lastly, before I turn it over to the moderators, I want to just introduce Dawn Youngs, who will be sitting up front here. She is holding the cards that will be, uh, indicate as to when they only have, I think it's whatever seconds left, we'll go over that, right? Uh, but wanted to introduce her, because she is the, the, also the executive producer of this whole thing. So quick give it up for <laughs> Dawn Youngs. Thank you. All right, I'm out of here. Michael, Jax, you're on. Candidates, welcome. Uh, good luck with your campaigns. We are going to start with a three-minute opening statement. Um, Don is going to be doing our uh, timing. <coughs> you announce what the uh, yellow means. This will be 15 seconds. Done. Okay. <laughs> what, is, what is the get off the stage card? <laughs> now that, that's me. That's you. That's okay. me. Thank you very much. Um, Please adhere closely to the, uh, the flags. Uh, if you keep talking for more than a few seconds after the red flag, I will embarrass you on TV. <laughs> All right, uh, three minute opening statements. We're gonna go in uh, order. Uh, Dr. Feldman, you're first. Thank you. Uh, I'm not easily embarrassed, but I'll try to uh, pay attention to the cards. I wanna thank everyone for having me. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Libertarian Party. I love libertarians from the most abolitionist, anarchist, radical to the most pragmatic Rand Paul supporters. I love libertarians. But libertarians come in different varieties and I'm glad that I have an experience with some Texas libertarians. Uh, I most recently came from uh, a debate in Los Angeles 
And, uh, you know, I've seen plenty of the, you know, the hippie flowers and pot libertarians. I want to see some Smith and Wesson and Jack Daniels libertarians. <laughs> Now, a lot of being a candidate, a lot of politics is communication. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I have to say is, uh, you know, I, I'm not a politician, I'm a physician. Uh, it's different. Uh, when physicians lie, we get uh, imprisoned. When politicians lie, they get elected. <laughs> so I'm, I wanna change it. So, but, but don't believe what I say. Don't believe anything we say, check it. Uh, I appreciate it. It shows that you're engaged. Uh, I really, you know, I, I uh, ran for uh, Ohio Attorney General. I got 100,000 votes, more than my friends and family. But I did it for the Libertarian Party, not for me. There's really no political office or appointed office I ever really wanted. But it occurs to me there's one office that, that I would gladly take, and it would be an honor to be the U.S. Ambassador to the free and independent Republic of Texas. <laughs> I, I've been practicing my, my Texan for my communication. You can let me know how I do. Uh, when considering Hillary Clinton, she's, she's slipperier than fried lard and meaner than a skillet full of rattlesnakes. Now, I tried to, to find something for Donald Trump, but none of the Texas idioms really seemed, you know, 50, it was it, a 10 gallon mouth, uh, all hat, no cattle. This didn't really, didn't really express what I wanted to express. And it, maybe it's because I don't have that experience. So I had to fall back on my own experience in New York City, Washington, D.C., and probably mostly Baltimore, Maryland, and fall to the idioms of the plain speaking folk who would say that Donald Trump is a fucking asshole, a spoiled, selfish bully, and a bigoted motherfucker. And that's why we call it Charm City. Don't, don't hold back, okay? All right, um, Shauna? I don't know how to follow that one, Mark. <laughs> I will tell you that I don't like Donald Trump. And it's our responsibility as a liber libertarian party to make sure that he does not become the next US president. And my God, to make sure that Hillary, who is a traitor to this nation, does not become the next US president. <laughs> I love this party. I think I've been a libertarian my whole life. When I was just four, well, maybe it was five years old, my parents dropped me off at school and I said, I don't like this school. I remember this too, I don't wanna be here. And when it ended, I threw my papers down and I took off walking out of there. And long story, they held me out and they didn't know what to do with me, with this self-independent person. And so, you know, I was raised Christian, so that worked, Christian parents. Um, who were both ministers, and I did all that singing. I worked with youth, I worked with children, did a lot of outreach. But this independence inside of me that's bucked the government, that's bucked every, every system trying to control me, has not left. And I finally found my home with the Libertarian Party. And I'm here to stay, and I'm going to help you with everything I've learned. I've been an organizer for another campaign. They, direct, they recruited me. I did this NASA internship. Next thing I know, I got recruited. Well, we got this, this person. It was Obama, okay? We got him into office. I know the stuff that's not in the white papers, the stuff that you gotta go up to the levels to learn how to run, how to win a presidential campaign. I'm gonna teach you guys everything. I hope to be the nominee. I need 30 people who give me a chance and 10% to debate, which I'd love to do. But you get me in there, regardless whoever that nominee is, I'm gonna help this party get the percentage they need with whatever I can give to this party. Dr. Johnson. I've had an amazing, oh, is oh, my time oh, up? No, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> well, tell me when my time's up. I'll just say, because this is important, 
I've got to go to several debates with these guys, meet a lot of libertarians, and you would not believe the diversity of libertarians that we have. It's all over, and everybody that I've met, the common thing that they have is they don't want this corrupt government to get away with what they're doing now. I will go in and I will prosecute them. Our government is controlled and it's been overtaken by those who do not love this country, who do not love freedom, and I'm going to go after each and every one of them. And I'll end with that. <laughs> I'd like to <clears throat> tell you a few things about myself maybe that you don't know. Um, one is, is that I have never said that I am going to be the Libertarian nominee for president. I think that that would be arrogant. I think that that would be assuming, and that's not who I am. That isn't to say that I don't want to become the nominee. I want to become the nominee. I want to make a pitch that I'm the guy to vote for. And for starters, uh, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, I started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque in 1974 and actually grew it to over a thousand employees. I understand what government can do when it comes to regulation. I understand what it takes to make a payroll. I'm also an athlete. I've been an athlete my entire life. Health and wellness is something that's really important to me. Uh, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in uh, 29 years. Um, <laughs> I've, I've climbed the highest mountain on each of the seven continents, and what that says is, is that I know how to put one foot in front of the other. I know what it's like to climb uphill, and I know what it is to persevere, to just keep after it. Um, that everything that we do, um, something goes wrong, and you can either persevere or you can roll up on the couch and say, that's the end of things. I was also the governor of New Mexico. Uh, I distinguished myself as governor of New Mexico by perhaps vetoing more bills than the other 49 governors in the country combined. So when you talk about, I'm the government skeptic. Um, I really don't believe um, that government, although it's well-intentioned, uh, passes legislation that actually positively affects our lives from the standpoint of time and money, and like I say, I stood up to that uh, in a big way, more than the other governors combined. I ran two campaigns for governor where I did not mention my opponent in print, radio, or television. I think people want to vote for somebody as opposed to not voting for someone else. Give people a reason to vote for you. I tell the truth. Um, I admit mistakes. Uh, I am on time to a fault. Um, I live by the golden rule. Do unto others as I would like others to do unto me. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Austin Peterson. I am from Missouri. I was born in Independence. I was raised on a horse farm in Peculiar, just a short drive from a town called Liberty. Uh, I was steeped in libertarianism as a young man. Uh, I learned about personal liberty from my parents who were deep religious, and they taught me uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I learned about economic liberty when my mother and father sent me out into the fields in the summers to plant chrysanthemums and to sell them to the people of my small town. I learned the value of a hard day's work and how to earn a dollar. Uh, I was also taught how to ride a horse and how to shoot a gun and how to respect a gun. My father was in the Special Forces. He was a Green Beret. Uh, that Green Beret sits above my fireplace and I have great respect for our service members because of that. And I think that I would be the best nominee for the Libertarian Party because while I'm sort of the anti-establishment candidate right now uh, in this anti-establishment party, I think it's time for us to shake it up and to bring a pure, hardcore Libertarian message to the American people in a way that they find palatable. Because I think that we can sell our principles to the American people as long as we're selling it with the veneer of the sort of establishment in a sense. You know, there was a, a famous radical who said that real revolutionaries do not flaunt their radicalness, but they cut their hair, they put on suits and ties, and they infiltrate the system from within. 
Well, let me tell you something. I've been fighting every single day almost for the last 10 years for this cause. I started with Ron Paul in New York City where I took a 12-man operation and we raised a million dollars and we got 1,200 volunteers for Ron Paul. But it, didn't, but it didn't end there for me because the Libertarian Party called me up and said, hey, we want some of that fire, we want some of that pizzazz. So I moved to Washington, D.C., and I turned your national office into a powerhouse of activism, and I plan on doing that again. Now, listen, I know that you guys, I'm a little bit fresh to you. I'm the youngest on this stage, but I am not inexperienced. I've also run a business and made payroll. I run one of the most powerful libertarian news magazines in the United States. The LibertarianRepublic.com reaches 1.5 million people a month. That's not all libertarians. I have been converting people to libertarianism for a decade. And I've been doing that on, uh, yes, I've been doing that for profit. So I think the ideas are marketable. Not only have I worked internationally to spread libertarianism to countries like Russia, Malaysia, Brazil, China, and other hot spots of authoritarianism, but I also produced one of the most libertarian television news shows, Judge Andrew Napolitano's Freedom Watch. Call me the right side of his brain. Now listen, listen, you guys are wonderful and I think that we have got a chance this year. The thing that makes me different from these candidates are the things that are going to make the general population go, this is the guy that we want. Because while I may be young, I think I re can represent a broad swath of the American people because I'm pro-constitution, pro-life, and pro-liberty, and that matters. I will get these Cruz supporters when he takes a knee, and I will get the Bernie Sanders supporters who don't want corporatism or crony capitalism. I'll fight for you, and I'll Thank make you. you proud to be a libertarian. I guarantee it. Thank you. I first read uh, Henry David Thoreau's Civil Disobedience when I was in college. Not, not because I wanted to, but because I was forced to. Now, there is a contradiction my brain has never reconciled. My first arrest for marijuana was in 1971 in the town of Bristol, Virginia. I was walking down the street, smoking a joint, and got arrested. When I got out of jail, I went straight home, rolled another one, went to the same location, lit up, and got arrested again. <laughs> when I got out of jail the third time, I was facing 25 years if I got caught in that town again. So I went to Mexico, where I was immediately arrested for marijuana. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the takedown went something like this. I was stopped at a federal checkpoint. I'd been smoking. Of course, you can smell it. And the federal, the, the federal says, uh, tienes marijuana. I go, see, sí. quantos? Creo que es demasiado. In other words, I think it's way too much, and I was arrested. So uh, after, after that, I decided that marijuana I should stay away from for a while. And so I started selling in Mexico jewelry uh, without a license. I go, why should I get a freaking license? And in, in Puerto Vallarta, I got arrested for selling jewelry without a license. Um, this has been sort of a, a, a habit of mine. Most recently, I think many of you have heard about uh, my belief situation. I was approached by a government agent who asked for a $2 million donation. I said no. A week later, my property was stormed by soldiers. My dog was shot. I was tortured. Uh, he came back the next day and said, have you reconsidered your donation? I go, get the F off my property. Um, we all know how that ended badly. When I came back to the States, my first day back, I was penniless. All I had was my jacket and my, and my shoes. Uh, and I met this woman uh, who was 30 years old, beaten and battered. Um, she was forced into prostitution at the age of 20 and for 10 years lived as a slave under a pimp. Uh, I rescued her personally, I married her, and I hope she's watching the stream tonight. I love you, baby. Um, most, most recently, I, I think I'm due for another arrest soon, and I'll explain why. So uh, three weeks ago, I debated the FBI mouthpiece about the, uh, the Apple FBI problem. And uh, I, I think I won that hands down. I also dug up, since I am John McAfee, and I can find out anything about you guys. So um, I dug up a contract from 2013 where they had the equipment that would let them do that. And I think I won that today. The Justice Department is once again going after Apple for someone else who's a drug dealer in New York City. I wrote an article 
for Business Insider this morning, and it's going, unfortunately, viral. The headline is, John McAfee to the FBI. I am the pit bull that will bite your ankles forever. <laughs> and in there, well, it's not good. So, you. you know, hopefully they'll let me finish this debate before they cart me off. But saying, thank you very much. Thank you for those opening statements. We appreciate each of y'all's opinions and coming here today. I will start off with the first question, which will be for all of you. Um, ending marijuana prohibition and the failed drug war has long been a libertarian position. States across the nation are legalizing medical and adult use of marijuana. Even here in Texas, we're preparing for the upcoming legislative session. In fact, we'll be doing a briefing tomorrow from 1 to 2 in the Elm Room. And on Sunday, delegates will be addressing the drug policy plank of our platform. When elected, how will you utilize your executive powers and the executive branch to end the failed war on drugs? I'll start with Mr. McAfee, please. Well, well first of all, I, I, I think that marijuana is separated out way too much. Drugs are drugs, whether it's coffee or alcohol or, or heroin. And that if we, in fact, do own our bodies, then there can be no limits to what we may do with them. And a government that tells me I can or cannot put something into my mind or my body is no government whatsoever. So my first act is I will pardon not just all the marijuana offenders, but every nonviolent drug offender in our prisons. There are, our, populations, our populations are overflowing with nonviolent citizens. Uh, that will be a start. Uh, and I know that the, the executive branch cannot create law, but it can. Uh, carry out the enforcement. So if you assign the DEA to some other task, well, why don't we just put you all along the border and just try to keep the drugs from coming in and stay the heck out of American citizens' ways? I think we can legally do that. Um, but, but it's a horrendous, horrifying situation. I've been in prison many times, unfortunately. Um, and I can promise you, it is a horrific I learned about liberty and freedom from prison, believe it or not, because once that is taken away from you, completely, I mean completely, then you understand its value. And you have to trust me, I understand this value. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. So I think I've assembled one of the, <coughs> the finest teams of uh, economic advisors, military advisors, uh, a lawyer and team of libertarian lawyers that I think would make a fantastic transitionary government for you all. <clears throat> and several of those advisors have told me that the president actually does have the authority to end the federal war on drugs on day one, and this is how. All we really need to do is to ask the head of the DEA to set the enforcement schedule of these drugs to zero. So I can end the federal war on drugs on day one, setting all drugs to zero and kicking the war on drugs back to the states, ending the federal war on drugs on day one, and I would do it. God damn, that's a good idea. Yeah. Now listen, dr drugs are dangerous, and there are some inherent problems of federalism, because, you know, Texas might execute you for looking at a joint. You know, California might make it mandatory to wake and bake every day. So, you know, <laughs> just realize that there are some problems inherent in that. But the president does have certain constitutional authorities, and he does have the ability to, uh, to set the drug policy in that way. We can end the DEA uh, by ending their enforcement ability, and that's what we ought to do. Ending the war on drugs is step one to, de to, end to uh, stopping the, the overflow of criminals in our system. We, we unfortunately do not have the power to pardon all nonviolent violent drug offenders because the president can only pardon someone who's convicted of a federal crime and that's important but I would absolutely consider all federal prisoners who have committed non-violent drug crimes and I would do so in accordance with the law the Constitution and with libertarian principles in mind I promise Governor Johnson uh, good news bad news um, Good news, in 1999, I was the highest elected official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana. Bad news is, in 2016, I am still the highest elected official to ever call for the legalization of marijuana. And yet, in 1999, 30% of Americans supported legalizing marijuana, and today, it's about 60%. 
Now, I guess Bernie Sanders rolled out of bed and hit his head, and I'm glad that he did, and he's now come out in favor of marijuana. Uh, but that just points to part of Bernie's lure, and I don't think he's going to end up to be the nominee. Uh, I don't think he's going to end up to be the nominee, and I think his followers, uh, that a big portion of his followers, recognize marijuana as being a really big issue. I think that 90% of the drug problem is prohibition related, uh, not use related. Uh, that's not to discount the problems with use and abuse, uh, but that should be the focus. A couple of predictions. I think that California in November is going to vote to legalize recreational marijuana. And overnight, I think 20 state legislatures will then just simply pass it through legislation as opposed uh, to the ballot box. Um, I really think that this country is going to take a quantum leap forward with the legalization of marijuana, recognizing first and foremost that it's so much safer than everything else that's out there, starting with alcohol. Something that is not all that well known, and that is in Colorado, um, the campaign to legalize marijuana was a campaign based on marijuana is safer than alcohol. I would pardon all those nonviolent, victimless uh, criminals behind bars in federal prison. And as governor of New Mexico came to recognize that the majority of, uh, of federal prisoners are there on drug-related, really drug-related marijuana crime. Dr. Sterling. Whereas some of the candidates are trying to work their way around this, um, I know Peterson was mentioning possibly some executive orders that, was it executive orders that you would do? No, actually, uh, you, you just- I'm curious, instruct the I'll DEA. use my tongue, go ahead. Yeah, in, okay. You would instruct the DEA to set the federal drug schedule to zero. Okay, I don't know what, I, I'm not sure how you got to that, um, how you got to that, but I do know this, that pursuant to our U.S. Constitution, the federal government has no right to regulate the drugs, and that's the truth. That is a decision for the states, and that's a decision for the people. And via the Constitution, I will pursue those who have violated it, and I will go after them strong. And this so-called government who's bringing whatever, shadow government or whatever these people are that are actually bringing these drugs in, I spent two years in Guatemala fighting for children's rights and fighting corruption. I hired criminal attorneys to help me in this war. I'm not scared to go after these people and we will go after them. As far as those who have been put into prison and they're nonviolent and it's for drugs, I will seek to have legislation brought to me and I will support it so that I can make sure and not have this, this continue, that we can go back and try and find a way to help them through counseling, but they should not go to jail. They should, they should not be in prison. This is ridiculous and this has targeted a lot, of our, uh, a lot of minorities. And so I will aggressively go after this and make it to where we can actually provide some way to get these people who have, in my opinion, who have been put into prison and suffered wrongly to right them from the injustices that they have had to suffer under our corrupt government. Thank you. Dr. Feldman. They say opportunity knocks but once. Reality keeps knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and nobody answers the door. There is reality. Marijuana is not a drug. It's a plant. It's an herb. I disagree with those who want to regulate marijuana like alcohol and tobacco. It should be normalized like caffeine and chocolate. I will admit that I have never used marijuana uh, because I've never smoked anything in my life and the brownies just have too many carbs. And also the fact that it's illegal makes it kind of inconvenient, as John has shown. <laughs> I'll tell you though, you know, we had our Libertarian Party convention in Colorado, but they had it in Colorado Springs, one of the places that makes marijuana illegal. <laughs> makes no sense to me. Now, I would not, I, I do not approve of medical marijuana 
because marijuana is not medicine. It's therapeutic, but it's not a drug. A lot of things are therapeutic. Tea can be therapeutic, my mother's chicken soup can be therapeutic, and good sex is therapeutic, but I don't want it regulated by the FDA. <laughs> and as, as far as releasing and pardoning prisoners, uh, you know, I, I would not separate out uh, uh, drug crimes. You know, if the purpose of prison is punishment, then if somebody steals a thousand dollars and I as a taxpayer are paying thirty thousand dollars a year to keep him in prison, who's the one being punished? We need alternatives. We need to let these people out to join their families and, and, uh, and support themselves and their families. I'm not so much about, about freedom and liberty. I'm about power and control. I uh, agree with the non-aggression principle, but I add a second principle. I call it the positive empowerment principle. We need to maximize the power of individuals to, to control themselves, their property, and their environment as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others. I believe we have a Twitter question coming up next. So the question is, what would each of you do to get the federal government out of public education? And for which candidate? It, All of them. Well, according to our schedule, you're going to get pick okay, one then, candidate. Then Gary Johnson. Okay. Uh, education? Get the federal government out of public education. Uh, I would abolish the federal Department of Education. Um, <laughs> I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice. Uh, I really think that bringing competition to education would really change education. If we could unleash tens of thousands of educational entrepreneurs to improve on education, that would be incredibly uh, exciting. And when it comes to the Federal Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education gives each state 11 cents out of every school dollar that every state spends, but it comes with 15 cents worth of strings attached. Federal government says you need to do A, B, C, and D, and we'll give you 11 cents. Well, A, B, C, and D cost 15 cents. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I think we all think that the Department of Education was established under George Washington. It was established under Jimmy Carter. And tell me what has been value added since that happened in the, in the 80s? Nothing. Great, so let's check in with what's going on at the mission control wall over here. Over here is the real-time mentions, and before this debate started, uh, you know, you would get a peak every 15 seconds or so. As you can see right now, uh, it's peaks after peaks after peaks. Each one of these colors represents a different candidate or also the convention itself. So we are getting bl blown up all over the internet, folks. That's what's going on in here right now. Uh, a couple of the stories that were going on. Uh, obviously, people are repeating quotes that have been going on in this room. Very, very good, gentlemen. And these pictures, and Clayton's just dominating the board up here with his blue bonnet picture. <laughs> so keep the tweets and the Facebook posts coming. Remember to use the hashtag Liberty Now, and uh, let's change the world, folks. Okay, uh, we're going to do our second round. Uh, we'll ask one question. All of the candidates get to answer the same question. You have two minutes for your responses. Um, first question. Imagine that you're in a television studio in San Francisco, and you're getting ready for their local version of the Today Show. The discussion so far has been focused on the upcoming anniversary of the school shooting in Sandy Hook. Surely, you don't agree with that NRA lunatic Wayne LaPierre that all teachers should be armed. What is your solution to the growing violence that's in this nation? And should we amend or abolish the obsolete Second Amendment? John. You made the assumption that I do not want all teachers to be armed. Um, <laughs> The 
The Second Amendment is a necessary and structurally integral part of our Constitution. People have always gone armed. I mean, in the Renaissance, the, the most flowering period of intellectualism and beauty and art, look at, look at all of the paintings of all of these sweet faces. They all have swords and a dagger. And when pistols came along, a pistol stuffed in their belt. These were the, the literati of the time. We're, we're our people too. We don't no longer use swords, or for me they'd be too heavy to lift, but, but we, have, we have firearms. There is no difference. There is no difference whatsoever. We have a fundamental right to protect ourselves. There is no magic button that you can push when a burglar has broken into your house and is holding a gun to your head. There's no button you can push to make the police magically materialize between you and the police. They are not here to protect. They are here to clean up after you've been shot in the head. I'm sorry. Please, people, we are responsible for our own safety and the safety of those that we love, our families, our wives, our children. So, I, 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 you know, if anybody has ever Googled me, if you can find, you know, three pictures in a row that do not have me carrying a gun, I will eat my shoe right here. Um, <laughs> So I don't think there should be any doubt what, what side of the line I stand on. Not because I'm warlike. I've never drawn a gun on anybody, but I've never been unarmed either. Uh, and please, it, it's the most fundamental right, the right to self-protection. Thank you. Gary, Gary Johnson, you'll be next. Gary. Uh, I got to, I, there, there's a difference up here, and right or wrong, I did get to serve as governor of New Mexico for eight years, and after the shooting at Columbine, uh, the press had microphones in my face. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do, what do, you do to prevent another Columbine? <clears throat> I said, you're not going to like the answer. What do you do? What do you do? You're not going to like the answer. What do you do? Well, you arm teachers. You make it a requirement that teachers be armed, and you're not going to like that answer, but that's how you could potentially uh, limit the damage of something like that in the future. As governor of New Mexico, I did sign concealed carry. As governor of New Mexico, I stood up against limiting the caliber of a bullet or the number of bullets in a chamber. In my opinion, you start doing that and only the criminals are going to have the bigger caliber weapon or, or more bullets in the chamber. Um, and I believe in arming the good guys. Uh, so. Second Amendment is very important. It's something that I've stood up for my entire career and continue to stand up for. I think you can only have one bullet in the chamber. I could be wrong. I'm sorry? I, I was being funny. You can only have one bullet in the chamber. <laughs> Doc, thank am, I, am I right, folks? You're, this is Texas Dr. show, Goldman. you know. Right? Most laws are really given to the states. Only special uh, laws are in the Constitution. The reason why the right to bear arms is in our Constitution is because it's not about target practice or hunting or even self-defense. The reason it's in the Constitution is because it recognizes that the right of the individual is superior to the power of the state. I don't want a concealed carry license. I don't want a same-sex marriage certificate. I don't want a marijuana grower's permit. I have a constitution. I want a government that follows it and does not ask for permits and permissions and licenses for things that are none of the government's business. Yeah. Now, Rahm Emanuel, in a, in a period of weakness, spilled the beans. In a famous quote, he said, never let a crisis go to waste. It lets you do things you couldn't do otherwise. And what it does is it allows you to control the population. People ask me, what would you do to stop, to stop a, a columnite? You're asking me what I would do? You're making me king? Am I the absolute monarch? 
Am I the one? Is everyone going to listen to me and do exactly what I say? If that's the case, don't stop at guns. I could fix everything in a week. If everyone, if the criminals and everyone's going to listen to me, I'll fix everything. But the problem is, I won't be here forever. Somebody else will be king, and then they will infringe on the rights of individuals. So instead of asking what I would do, why don't we ask who should be making the decisions? Who should be controlling the guns? Should it be our government? It should it be our law-abiding citizens. Thank you. The NRA would give me an A+. Plus. I love guns. I was raised with guns. I will always defend our rights to have guns and to um, go against anyone who tries to infringe upon those rights. As far as Sandy Hook, that was ex an extremely horrifying and sad event that not only affected the children in that school, but affected children all over our nation. And when our president, Obama, can have guns protect his own children, then I feel that our children, if their families want it, if their schools want it, then they should have that same opportunity to protect their children. As an organizer for his campaign, they gave us a list that specifically said that they, they would not infringe upon the gun rights. It was a lie. They deceived America to get elected, and we saw them immediately go for the guns, start to, seek, uh, start to change the laws based on Sandy Hook. What they did was wrong. They should never have done that. What, when, I, when I saw that Obama was going back, and he was actually trying to get control and take these arms away, which is not what he ran on, okay? This was his real motive. We see, we see that now. I went out in defiance, and I got an AR-15. I live in Kentucky. It was great. Went to show, got an AR-15, and I was so proud carrying that thing out. And I put some videos on. You know what? They did not like it. I started teaching on the Constitution. They didn't like that either. And I actually had to leave my home because I got threatened. I had to leave. I came to Texas with family for safety. <laughs> on my way here, before that red card goes up, I went into, with my little girl, with my AR-15 sitting in our little Scion car, I went into a rest stop and had Department of Homeland Security came out with them staring their face right at me, scared the hell out of us. They were looking at me. They had targeted me. And as I began to drive off, I had two of them harass me. And because of that, when I realized after fighting for rights in children in Guatemala, one of the most dangerous countries, I had security. They moved us house to house for our safety. It was very dangerous, but I stayed there and fight. And when I saw that our own country was doing these things, that's, you want to know why I'm running for president of the United States? Because I'm not going to go down that road. And I can't do this by myself. The GOP won't do it. They're bought and paid for. The DNC won't do it. I am sorry to tell you this. The Libertarian Party, it's our only hope to change this country. And I need you guys. We need you guys. Everybody watching on TV. My time is almost up. You're watching Thank on TV. You. This is a packed house. There's people okay. everywhere in here. We Thank all you. need you. Well, Texas, let me tell you, I think that the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms ought to be a retail shop and not a government agency. <laughs> I, I consider myself a constitutionalist, but truly, we do not get our rights from the Constitution. We get our rights as because we are individuals, and our natural rights are intrinsic to us and to our humanity. And that includes the right to self-defense. The founders, the founders didn't write muskets in the Second Amendment for a Constitution. They wrote arms because they had foresight. Uh, and the Militia Clause is oftentimes quoted to us by liberals as a way to say, oh no, only public officials, only organized militias can have guns. Let me tell you why that's not true. Because George Mason, who was George Washington's hunting buddy, was asked the question of what does this Militia Clause mean? And he said, oh, I asked her, what then is the militia? It is the whole of the people, except for a few public officials. <laughs> So let me tell you, you know, I do actually believe in a form of gun control. We need to control the government's use of guns. The second, the, second one, the second Amendment wasn't written so that we could go hunting. It was meant to, so we could shoot at tyrants if our government ever became tyrannical. 
the, the McDonald versus Chicago gun case codified uh, to the states. Uh, it incorporated the Second Amendment. We now have an intrinsic individual right to bear arms because of those Supreme Court decisions. I do applaud them. Uh, but, you know, if I were President of the United States, I would ask Congress to send me legislation overturning the National Firearms Act immediately. Because there is no point... Ab, thank you. Yes, we need to overturn this law because, listen, uh, fully automatic machine guns aren't any more dangerous than a semi-automatic. And if we can educate liberals about this, then maybe we can make some ground with them. Because they see a gun that's black and they think it's scary. Well, if we had more gun education in this country and we could explain to people the relative safety of firearms, then I think we would have a safer country. An armed society is a polite society. I would defend gun rights to the last man, I promise you that. All right, so now I'm going to ask each one of you a direct question and then move on to the next person. I'm going to start off with Mr. McAfee. Your arrival at political activism has come, quote unquote, later in life. Could you describe your journey to this activism and how and why you feel that the Libertarian Party is right for you? Uh, indeed, thank you for pointing out my advanced stage. <laughs> uh, I, You're welcome. I believe I'm the oldest man in the room. Um, uh, by the way, as speaking of age, I'm, I'm 100 years older than, than Austin, and yet, <laughs> yet, every time I'm with him, he teaches me something new. That was effing brilliant about this drug schedule to zero. Duh. I mean, I was hoping, I was thinking I was going to have to march myself with my gang of thugs into prisons and break people out. But, you know, it's awesome. So now, um, I love that. I did come late to politics, uh, but I didn't come late to libertarianism. I mean, if you listened, you know, if you were not asleep during my opening statement, I've, I think that I have lived, literally lived, a libertarian life. Um, and, and I continue to do so, and, and here is why. I mean, I have lived that life for your children and your grandchildren. I have been to jail so that my daughter and granddaughter and other children will not have to go. There is no other way. You've got to stand up and do the hard thing. You have to face insurmountable odds. You do. Because here's the thing. By acquiescing to a government's demand to invade your mind and body, you are imposing on your children and grandchildren that same acquiescence without their knowledge. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. All right, the next one is for you, Austin. You distinguish yourself from the rest of the field with your position on abortion rights, claiming that you are pro-life. The current libertarian platform states, recognizing that abortion is a sensitive issue and that people can hold good faith views on all sides, we believe that the government should be kept out of this matter, leaving the question to each person for their conscientious consideration. Could you give us a more detailed explanation of your position from a libertarian perspective? When you say pro-life, what exactly do you mean? And what specific proposals are you making in relationship to this position? Absolutely. I've been convinced by Dr. Ron Paul on this issue. This is not a matter of religion to me. This is a matter of, of personal ethics. And I believe that libertarians should be pro-life because all humans deserve the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> listen, I, I'm very much a realist. I understand that the president does not have the authority. Murder is a state issue, uh, and I think that it should be left to the states. But there are some things that the president can do. Ending the war on drugs will allow women to purchase birth control over the counter. This is statistically proven to reduce the number of abortions. This is perfectly in line with the libertarian platform. It's the, it's the type of thing that liberals can get on board with, because nobody is pro-abortion. Nobody, I mean, unless you're actually a eugenicist, you know, you're not going to say, yes, we should kill the babies. Because I believe that it is a human life. And I, listen, I'm sort of a nerd. Um, I'm kind of a futurist. I like to think about the future of humanity. And this mass culling, I think, must stop. I believe that, it, that science one day will solve these problems and that we can have less coercive ways uh, in, in order for us to solve the problems of abortions. I wouldn't ban, you know, uh, RU486, uh, or, and I wouldn't take away birth control pills. The reality is, though, is that libertarians must present to the American people a positive life ethic, a consistent pro-life ethic, which means that we must also be against the death penalty. 
We must lift ourselves up out of the barbarians of ages. We must be better than those enemies that we seek to destroy, the ISIS enemies, those who burn people in cages. We want to protect every life that we can because humanity is the, is the, is the desire to live. And, and without life, there is no liberty. So I don't believe that I'm in conflict with the libertarian platform. I just love humanity. I love my fellow man and I love children and babies. And I think that, listen, if we don't have more libertarian babies, then we won't grow. So please protect the children and believe me and trust me and have faith that I am fighting for the lives and liberty of every single one of us, even the unborn. Governor Johnson. We have been at war forever. <laughs> when you are elected to be president, what would be your strategy to get us out of the current conflicts that we are in? Well, um, f first of all, um, I would stop putting, I, I believe that our military interventions have made things a lot worse. Uh, they're not the cause for terrorism, but they've made things a lot worse. So let's stop. Let's stop with the military interventions. Let's stop putting troops on the ground where troops are, men and women are dying, maimed, injured for life. Uh, let's stop dropping bombs. Uh, let's stop with the drone flights that are killing thousands of innocent people that are making this situation worse, not better. We can cut off the funding to terrorism, something that uh, Saudi Arabia has taken a lead on, so have the Emirates. Uh, we need to involve Congress in declaring war uh, on uh, terrorism, something that currently has become a, a, an executive prerogative along with the military. That's just plain wrong. So we do have a very real terrorist threat. We are going to attack if attacked, but currently let's contain what's happening over there. Uh, let's cut off the funding. Let's involve Congress. Uh, in this so that decisions made regarding our military actions, if there are any, are going to be made um, under the auspices of all of us, uh, that all of us are going to see this as a very transparent debate and discussion that should be taking place. Thank you. <laughs> Pastor Sterling, you were recently a Republican. Can you address your shift to libertarianism? I was actually raised a Republican. And being raised a Republican, you're not allowed to be anything else but a Republican. So let's see, I'm 43 now. <laughs> so that was pretty strongly ingrained in me. And um, I never got involved. I never did like what I'm doing right now. And I think the reason why I didn't get involved, and I, I didn't do much just because in my heart, I just wasn't a Republican. <laughs> and then, of course, I told you how I got recruited to help the Democrats out. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, this is cool. They're really, they love the grassroots. We're all going to um, help each other. And I just, I just really thought everybody's going to help each other. And we did. And I learned all the stuff I learned and learned how to get a president elected. But then I saw Obama. I saw the whole list of all the lies that he did. And I said, you know what? This party. <laughs> is the same as the other. They're run by the same, and I don't want anything to do with them. Whew. And then, <laughs> but I didn't know about the Libertarian Party yet, okay? So y'all have to really get the word out because people will love the Libertarian Party once they know about you, they really will. And so what I did is I said, yeah, I gotta do something. I went back with Republicans. I said, I'm gonna run against Mitch McConnell. At that point, that was after they, the, the, Homeland, the, the Homeland Security kind of came and followed me and made me mad. Then I said, you know what? I'm gonna run for President of the United States. Let's, do, let's deal with that. And uh, what I thought is I'm gonna go ahead and probably need some political experience <laughs> since I didn't have any. So I ran against Mitch McConnell and I got a lot of experience doing that. And um, when I was, um, when I gained the experience I needed, I pulled out, and you won't believe what I did. I endorsed a Libertarian candidate, and it was David Patterson, and he was the first one who reached out to me, then another Libertarian reached out to me, and it's really people that reached out to me that drew me into this party, and I thank you guys for accepting me, and I love it, and I'll help you however I can. Yeah. 
Dr. Feldman, you proudly advertise that your vote is not for sale. Yet we know that the presidential race can be a very expensive undertaking. So this is a twofold question. How do you propose to fund your race? And do you have a specific policy about campaign, campaign finance reform? Absolutely. I mean, basically, there's, there's two parts of this campaign. I, I actually started from assuming that I've been elected president of the United States, I've been sworn in, will I be able to balance the budget? Will I be able to move this country in the right direction? I have my balance and credit plan, it's implementable, I can do it. Now, so let's keep working backwards. How do I get elected to be president? How do I get the libertarian nomination? So there's two parts. First question is, how do I get to the nomination? And the fact is, I'm an anesthesiologist, I have some extra funds, uh, and uh, even with a few $5 contributions, I can travel, I can stay in hotels, it's really no problem. Uh, I have a wife who is not supportive, but <laughs> when I told her I was thinking of running for president, my wife is no libertarian, but she had a very libertarian message. She said, do what you want, I can't stop you, just leave me out of it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if our government said same-sex marriage, marijuana, guns, health care, retirement, do what you want, just leave me out of it. So now you know, people say, you know, why is it? Now, my, my policy is I accept contributions from anyone, but there's a $5 limit. Try to donate $6, and uh, it's a sorry, you can't do that because it's over your limit. Now, why is that? It's because I, here's the thing. America agrees with our principles, but they're not voting for us. Why is it? I think they hear us. I think they agree with us. I don't think they believe us. I was born and raised in, in and around Washington, D.C. I knew politicians. They lie. We're up here. Politicians lie. That's why they don't believe. So we can't tell them. We have to show them. And that is one way I can show. I can tell a poor Hispanic guy in the inner city, if you'll donate $5 to my campaign, you'll be my biggest donor. Thank you. I really like to ask the same question of all the candidates so I can compare answers. When Gary Nolan and I ran um, in 2004, we were actually very good friends. Um, we characterized ourselves as two Clydesdales pulling the same beer wagon. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to pick one of your opponents and tell me why I should vote for them. S starting with Shauna. I'm a strong believer in the LP non-aggression principle. I believe through mediation, through diplomacy, through relationship building, that we can avoid force and aggression. As a U.S. president, I will uh, make an oath to the U.S. Constitution with the guidance of the LP NAP. There are three people on this stage, NAP, excuse me. There are three people on the stage that don't have that same opinion. There is one person that does. So that person right here <laughs> would be Dr. Feldman. He has a strong uh, a view of the importance of the non-aggression principle. He's been defending it. I've been watching him in action, and he's been defending it aggressively. Some of our other candidates on the stage have not, and we also now, I, from what I understand, have a whole state that is not wanting to um, defend it either. So that's a very big concern for me. I think when you go to vote, the delegates really need to take that into consideration, and I'll leave it to them if they want ex the other three want to explain their views on it. But I do know that I have been watching, and I've been looking to see who's strongly uh, defending it, and Dr. Feldman and I are the only ones that happen at, to this point. Thank you. Austin? I could actually, I could say a lot of nice things about everybody up on this stage. Um, <clears throat> I've known Governor Johnson for years. I supported him heartily in 2000. Uh, and 12, and if he wins, I will support him with all of my heart as well again. Um, Mr. McAfee and I have become close friends. I look at him sort of as a father figure. Uh, and, uh, 
I'm honestly, I'm insanely jealous of his life, and uh, uh, who wouldn't want to live that kind of utopian libertarian life in, in South America? And, and an international man of mystery and intrigue. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. McAfee is an inspiration to me. Um, he, I think he's got the sex appeal that this ticket needs. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and uh, I could say a, a ton of nice things. Shauna Sterling has the love and the hope for the future. She represents the faith-based libertarians. Uh, uh, Dr. Feldman would be a fantastic Surgeon General. I think any of these candidates on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are lots of good reasons to support any candidate on the stage. Governor Johnson is a great voice for liberty. He's got the experience and the credentials that we definitely lack with the rest of us. So we all have our strengths and weaknesses, um, and I could make a case for anybody up on the stage, but uh, vote for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Johnson? Not a cop-out, but any one of the four candidates outside of myself here would make a better candidate, make a better president uh, than anyone that the Republicans are going to put up or anyone that the Democrats are going to put up. <laughs> Mr. McAfee. Uh, I have to agree with, uh, with Gary Johnson. Uh, if you look at the current field, it's like uh, choosing between uh, a brain tumor and castration, and I just, <laughs> I, I, I could not, with all of my heart, vote for either of those. Um, and in all seriousness, uh, uh, Gary's correct. I think any of us up here, any of us up here, would make a far uh, better president than anything that the Republicans or Democrats have vomited out in the past 20 years. So, thank you very much. Dr. Feldman? Uh, so I'm also a libertarian, so I don't listen to what people tell me to do. So I will also give a plug to, to each of the, our candidates. Uh, John McAfee is like the teenage son I never had. Uh, <laughs> Austin Peterson brings a freshness and energy and a not uh, and feel pretty easy on the eyes. Uh, Gary Johnson. Uh, has, the, has the experience, and people know, he, you don't have to guess how he would be as, a, as an executive, he's been there. Uh, but you asked me to pick one, and I'll tell you, I would pick Shauna for one reason especially, and that is I'm all about power and control, and people are trying to control the Libertarian Party. John Stossel is trying to control the Libertarian Party. He tells us that we only have three candidates. Uh, Steve Curbell dropped out because he said John Stossel did not consider him uh, a, a, a candidate. Well. I think that we should take control from the media. We shouldn't let the media control us. We should control the media. We want, we should have the media after our convention. I want the media to say, what the fuck? What happened there? And we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to our uh, viewing audience now, and uh, we're going to take two Twitter questions uh, directed to each question directed to a particular candidate. So this question is for Mr. McAfee. Um, your arrival at political activism came later in life, and could you describe your journey to this activism and how and why you feel the Libertarian Party is the place for you? We, we are libertarians. That one got answered earlier, right? Yes. Give him another one. Give him another one. I, I'm happy to answer it if that makes everybody happy. I'm, I'm very easy. I think they asked that already. Uh, they did, but I'll answer it again. It's easy for me. <laughs> another question. That'll please everybody here. You did address this on Stossel, but there's a great deal of chatter about your legal status in regards to the troubles in Belize. Could you tell us how you would address this concern to a wider audience? I will be more than happy when the Japanese create an android that can speak for me because I get that question more often than I get hello or you're welcome. So um, <clears throat> more than happy to answer it. Um, I, I never was charged with anything. 
I mean, I've been charged with lots of things, but they are all civil libertarian things. With one exception, I was charged with driving under the influence of Xanax. That was stupidity. That was not civil disobedience. Everything else is because I refuse to submit to the, the injustice of the world. Um, so w what happened is, uh, as I said earlier, they they tried to extort money from me. I didn't want to didn't want to pay it. Didn't feel up to it that day. Um, the um, the government police is the most corrupt in the world, by the way. And 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 the the prime minister has had all of his business competitors removed. They just disappear. You know, they fall off of a cliff, they drown. Their truck drives into a river. They get shot by a burglar. Uh, that's simply the way it is. Um, so after that event, when the soldiers stormed my property, destroyed my property, shot my dog, the whole ball of wax was just no fun, I promise you. My neighbor was murdered six months later. Uh, and I truly believe to this day that the government of police did that murder. Why? So they could then question me. Because ever since they stormed my property, the press had been around me constantly. Because it was a big story, you know. Uh, uh, American entrepreneur arrested, roughed up, tortured, and so on and so forth. So they couldn't touch me, but they could question me. And in Belize, legally, you can question someone for 60 days. If you don't like the answers, you question them for another 60 days. And in many cases, they string you up by your heels, put a football helmet on your head, and beat it with a baseball bat. I was not up to that that day. Um, and so I went on the run. The pure and simple, I was never charged. I was never even a suspect. I was simply wanted for questioning, like every single one of my neighbors were wanted for questioning, and they chose to be questioned. I chose not to. And it's as simple as that. Uh, but again, I, I have made one legal mistake of driving under the influence, and I regret that. And unfortunately, it came late in life. It was last year. So thank you very much. And the second question is for Dr. Feldman. While you are a longtime and respected member of the Libertarian Party, you have not gained as much attention as the other candidates in this race. If nominated, how would you bring your visibility to a national level? Well, it's actually part of, part of the strategy because, you know, if we had someone who uh, has the the, the uh, wonderful attractiveness, the, the inspired voice, just a very, very special person. If they're going to win because they're a special person, they're also an easy target and they're easily destroyed. You know, we don't, you know, people say, well, how are you going to raise money? How are you going to get name recognition? Well, if name recognition is the most important thing, if money is the most important thing, then we're looking at a President Clinton or a President asshole Donald Trump. Now. <laughs> But what we have is we have principles and we have political integrity and they don't have that and they can't get that. Uh, and this was also part of the reason for my $5 maximum contribution. I was having a discussion with someone in the uh, very high up in the Republican Liberty Caucus. He said, let me explain to you why libertarians cannot possibly win. I said, why is that? He said, because whatever issue starts to get traction with the public, whether it's marijuana legalization or same-sex marriage or, or gun control or, or civil asset forfeiture, whatever it is, if it starts getting traction, the Republican Party can get on top of that bigger and louder and look like they invented it. And there is no way you could win. I said, well, let me ask a question. What about my $5 maximum contribution? Suppose that starts getting accepted by 3%, 5%, 7%, 10%. Do you think the Republican Party could get in front of that? He thought for a moment and he said, I don't think so. That's how we're going to win. We're going to win on our principles. We're going to win on our integrity. The other thing I'll tell you is that my last name is Feldman. I'm proud of that name because my great-grandfather bought it to get onto the boat. But Feldman means man of the field, a farmer. So you throw dirt at me, you throw shit at me, I will grow tomatoes. <laughs> I'm not going to do a Ross Perot. Thank you very much. Um, we're in the third round. Um, we are actually ahead of schedule, so we're going to come up with additional questions. Um, All James. right. So this question is going to be for each of you guys to answer. Um, we've seen how hard it can be to work with a partisan Congress. Um, 
while staying true to libertarian philosophy, how do you plan to strategically implement or remove uh, policies so that libertarian principle can be turned into policy? And if you have any specific examples and how you've done this in the past, we would love to hear that. I'd like to start with um, Pastor Shauna Sterling, please. I think one of the things that that I would be good um, in this in this area is, um, is helping to um, bring people to negotiation to the negotiation table and to talk about this and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that I have a huge background in uh, pastoral counseling and it's just a matter of getting people to the table sharing their hearts and letting everybody get a feel for each other and once they do that they realize that you know what we're all Americans Yes, there's the, there's the Republicans, yes, there's the Democrats, and yes, there's the Libertarians, but we're really Americans, and when you, when you can do that, then you begin to see those other outside influences who are trying to buy seats, who are trying to buy their way into our government, and who have bought their way. I really don't have the heart to sit with them. I, I tend to prosecute them, and to try them, and to clean our government, get those kind of people out. So when I say I'm gonna go after them, that's, that's what I mean. I mean, there's no negotiating with the criminal. You just gotta go after them. And that's, that's, that's what I would do. But really, if we, get, if we sit down together, you'd be surprised at how libertarian the average American really is. And it's, and it's something that the Libertarian Party, I've been all over now, something we need to work on. Because when you're in at the GOP or the DNC, you're really brainwashed. <laughs> you really are. And it helps to have somebody who loves the Libertarian Party to sit down and just to reach out with them. And not to tell them, you're not Libertarian, you're horrible, you're our enemy. And if you don't do that and you just draw them along and you talk to them, you begin to see that they're going, that light will click on them, they'll be like going, you're right, the government is controlled. They are trying to tell me what to do. We have to do something about this. And you'll find that they can be some of your most loyal people who will help fight. And I actually, I have, uh, I have individuals across this nation. They're not libertarians. Some have come in. I believe if I can get this nomination, they love our country, I can bring them in. But these are the kind of people that don't just want to do the 5%. They want to go for the White House. You don't have to say we're going to win, but if you go for the White House, and that's what I plan, plan to do, I think I could bring in a lot of people into this party. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? Yeah, <clears throat> there are obviously lots of issues that we can work with Republicans on and Democrats on. There's a little libertarian in everyone, but let's be honest. If a libertarian president wins, that's a mandate to kick some ass. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> We're talking about cleaning house here. So with a wave of liberty in the United States and a presidential candidate who destroys the, the three-party systems, we have a mandate. <clears throat> so I will use the power of the veto to ensure that Congress sends me a path to a balanced budget. And that's what I'm pushing for. I will veto every unconstitutional bill that comes along my desk or one that does not set us on the path to a balanced budget. Now, I have got the plan that I think is the best way for us to address the problems of our debt and our deficit. That is the penny plan. And if you haven't heard of it, do me a favor, Google it. This is what we need to push the American people. One penny out of every federal dollar across the board, we cut spending and we pass a constitutional amendment, a balanced budget. If the American people have to balance their checkbooks, so should Congress. <clears throat> Right now, we are at 105% of spending uh, ratio of uh, spending to our GDP. We need to get that down. We need to get that down to around 18%. The government needs to live within their means. We can do this if we move towards a balanced budget amendment. And I would sign such a constitutional amendment to make the government live within their means. But truly, and Gary Johnson is correct, there is a little bit of a libertarian in everyone. So whichever Congress, uh, whichever House, <clears throat> excuse me, party is in control of Congress, you find the issues that you agree with them on and you work with them on that. If the Democrats are in control, we work on civil liberties issues, ending the war on drugs, um, <clears throat> ending crony capitalism, and bringing in the Democrats that are, that are principal Democrats on those issues. If Republic Republicans are in control, then we work on balancing the budget. So I think there's something for us to, be, to get done in Congress, but we're not just getting to, they're not getting sent there to make friends. We're getting sent in there to throw a few elbows and clean house. And that's the attitude we might have to take. It's a little bit uh, aggressive, we might say, but that's what I think the American people want. They want a president who can kick some butt when he gets in the White House, and I promise you that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. 
Dr. Feldman. Government is an instrument of force. It's a lethal weapon. But like a handgun, if it's kept under control and used properly, it can protect our rights. If we don't control it, it will infringe on our rights and the rights of others. We need to get government under control. I agree with Shauna, you don't negotiate with criminals. I will not negotiate with Congress. <laughs> the, the President of the United States has a lot of power and the President does not answer to Congress and does not answer to the Supreme Court, but answers to the Constitution of the United States. I have a constitutional plan. Number one, balance the budget and keep it balanced. If we have to for our nation, Ronald Reagan did a hiring freeze, he was sued, they, and, the, and the court said, if the President says it's necessary for the country, it's necessary for the country. I would put, uh, I will give a balanced budget to Congress, they can pass it, they could pass another balanced budget. If they don't, if they continue continuing resolutions by executive order, I will put spending caps across every federal agency to, to limit their spending to available revenue, period. Second, government can only do, according to the Constitution, what's necessary and proper. If, if people want to use their money to support private organizations to heal the sick and shelter the homeless, then government should not get a dollar of that money. I would introduce in my balancing credit plan a dollar for dollar rebate for all charitable contributions. This will cause a huge increase in donations to charity, and because we have a balanced budget, we're going to have to balance the budget. Uh, but we're going to have to cut the budget, and now we'll know what, where. When people are donating to educational institutions, I can go. I will not ab abolish the, the the Department of Education. I'll just say we've gone over what people have donated to privately to education, and you're left with seventeen dollars and thirty four cents. Knock yourself out. Mr. McCarthy. Well, I had an epiphany recently, and I finally understood there is one thing that the president can, in fact, do. That is, instruct the DEA to set the drug schedule to zero. That just came to me, so. <laughs> You're a smart man, Mr. McAfee. The founding fathers and mothers, yes, mothers, all these men were married. And if you've been married, you know exactly what influence a woman has in this world. And do not forget it if you're married. So now, um, the founding fathers and mothers purposely structured a government which was tripartite. What does that mean? Does, has anybody ever, ever milked a cow? Nobody. It's just Texas. Oh, yeah. Did you use a three-legged stool? Wonderful. Three-legged stools do not wobble, cannot wobble, and maintain stability, no matter what chaos is going on around it. So... If we truly act on libertarian principles, which are very, very simple, they are the principles within the Constitution, our right to privacy, our right to self, the fundamental concept that we do not harm one another and we don't take each other's property, and we keep our commitments and our agreements, we keep our word. Really, is there anything else in the Constitution other than that? Everything else is built upon those precepts. A libertarian president has the Constitution on his side or her side, I promise you. And if you go in with a pure heart and you believe in and act on these principles, Congress will get a clue, I promise you. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Johnson. This is going to sound really naive, but um, I'd never been involved in politics before pr <laughs> prior to getting elected governor of New Mexico. So naively, I really thought that Democrats and Republicans would come together when it came to good ideas. Well, that's just not the case. There's Republican dogma that uh, Republicans won't cross over that line. There's Democrat dogma that they won't cross over that line. And I will tell you that I was an equal opportunity vetoer when I was governor of New Mexico. I got elected as a Republican. It was two to one Democrat versus Republican in the legislature. A third of the bills I vetoed were Republican bills. 
My favorite bill that I vetoed was a dog and cat exercise bill. Uh, it, was gonna, it was a Republican bill that was going to require pet stores to exercise their dogs and cats two hours a day, three times a week. Now, I got to tell you, it's a really good idea. That's where I would like to buy my dogs and cats, but I vetoed it because I said, if I sign this legislation, the next thing I'm going to have to do is fund the dog and cat exercise police. So I think as a libertarian president, you could challenge Republicans to balance the federal budget. You could challenge Democrats. We've got the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. And really, it has to do with mandatory sentencing. It has to do with ending the drug war. Challenge them. They're supposed to be about military intervention, but they're not. But challenge them on that. And as opposed to crony capitalism, bring a libertarian perspective for the whole country. Look, let's eliminate income tax. Let's eliminate corporate tax. Let's abolish uh, the IRS. Let's... <laughs> when it... When it comes to jobs, let's talk about entrepreneurism. Let's talk about the fact that you can take your expertise and apply it entrepreneurially, creating your own job, creating other jobs. Look, the model of the future is Uber. It's Uber everything. It's Uber accountant, it's Uber electrician, it's Uber doctor, it's Uber lawyer. It's eliminating the middleman, allowing direct payment by you and I as customers to the individuals serving up those goods and services. Thank you. I want to get away from ideology a little bit. Your wake-up call comes at 3 o'clock in the morning. Your plane leaves the ground at 6 a.m. You do 12 to 16 interviews before your 8 p.m. fundraising dinner. You don't get to eat because you're answering questions to your biggest supporters. You finally get to bed around midnight. This is an average day. Some days are worse. You have to repeat that 150 days in a row. Please describe how, how many hours a day you were willing to dedicate to this campaign and what toll you expected to have on your physical health and on the relationship with your family. Starting with John. You just described my work in every business that I started, um, which has been many. Um, my first company, McAfee Associates, I worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I went without eating. I went without sleep sometimes for three or four days at a time. But all entrepreneurs have to do this. I mean, this is just the necessity of success in business. Uh, and I founded 17 businesses in my 70 years. Uh, all but four of them flourished. Uh, McAfee, I sold for um, 7.8 billion, or it sold for 7.8 billion. Uh, the total of all the companies I've started are valued now at over $20 billion. I wish I had all that money. I do not. Um, so I'm, I'm no stranger to hard work. and You cannot succeed in life in doing anything without hard work. You've got to put your nose to the grindstone, your shoulder to the wheel. Um, and, and if you're seeking the, the highest office in this country and you're not willing to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, you will fail just like my competitors in business failed when they took on a 40-hour week for themselves. It can't be done. It can't be done. So what toll is it going to take on me? I don't have a clue. I've been doing this my whole life. Um, and I'm still breathing. So I definitely have the commitment, and I certainly have the experience in, in hard work. Thank you. Austin? So I've had the good fortune of having a tremendous campaign manager come onto my team who is an entrepreneur himself who has been fighting uh, doggedly every day. I'd love to give some credit to him, Mr. Tony Stiles. Tony, thank you very much. About, about four to six weeks ago, we were in Washington, D.C., and it was 3 a.m., and my girlfriend and my staff had all been passed out, and there was nowhere for me to sleep except for a dirty pile of laundry against the wall. And uh, I curled up against the cold wall and I slept with a airline pillow on my back, uh, behind, around my neck because <clears throat> it, I didn't want to disturb everyone who had been working so hard to get me here today. Uh, and when the state of Colorado decided that they would not invite me to their forum specifically because they were afraid of what I had to say in their forum, I drove, we drove 18 hours that night straight to Colorado to tell them, uh, give them a piece of our mind and to talk about liberty and free speech and say what that really means. So, 
If you think that when the presidential debates comes around that I'm going to slink away even if they don't invite us, even if we don't make the, the high percentage, the ridiculous percentage, you got another thing coming. I will be there. I will be there. I won't back down. Governor Johnson has stated that there's no way that a libertarian wins the White House unless they get into the base. What kind of attitude is that? We've got to be true. We've got to be champions. Listen, then will you drop out? And hit, then why not drop out if you don't get into the debates? Because they're not going to let you in, Governor. You need a champion. I am the Freedom Ninja, and I will fight for liberty, <laughs> just like I have every day for 10 years. This is a defeatist attitude. He is a defeatist. Do not nominate this man. Nominate the man who will fight for you till the very end. Because listen, for the last 10 years, every day on the Freedom Watch I have stood. I am the night watchman. And there is no one who will stop me from pushing this message. No Republican, no Democrat, and no Libertarian. Because I am my own man, and I fight for liberty and what I think is right. And I will speak my mind, though those may they come against me. So do not give in to defeatism. Fight. Do not give in to the end, because it's never the end for liberty, no matter what happens. Thank you. <laughs> Governor Johnson? Well, what you're describing is something that I've done three times. Nobody's worked harder than I have. No one works harder than I have. Having run for governor twice, uh, having been the libertarian nominee in 2012, I will tell you, though, that what experience brings to the table is, is I don't do the things that don't work. I still work as hard, but I don't do the things that didn't work, and that was something that I learned through experience. There is no way that a third party wins if they're not in the presidential debates. I am suing the Presidential Debate Commission to bring that about. And last week, I polled at 11% in a national poll. That has never happened before that I've been, that my name has been included in this. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you, when it comes to the presidential debates and the, and the presidential debate commission as the rules now stand, you have to be at 15% to be in the presidential debates. You think they're going to state tomorrow that you can't be in the presidential debates tomorrow and I'm going to give up? Hell no! They're going to state that maybe maybe two, three weeks before the election. So this is a no give up the whole time. And if you think I'm going to give up, then vote for Austin. Let me tell you something. No, 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 no. Listen, no, we, we've got, everybody knows our policies here. It's actually this is Shauna's the, turn, excuse us. Thank it's you. actually Shauna's turn. Thank you very much. You had your Listen, two minutes. This is a debate, guys. No, you want to hear what he had to say. I was addressed. I was addressed. That's I have a not chance. part of our debate rules. Let, 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 Thank let, you let very much, speak, Austin. He was addressed. I paid for this microphone. Let me tell you something. Okay. Austin, show some respect and put down the microphone and let Shauna speak. There's a please. lot of newcomers up on this stage right now that want to tell you guys how it is. And let me tell you something. Austin? Austin? It's not your time. All right. Shauna? Let me tell you how this works. I'm going to be right up front with you because I dealt with Mitch McConnell on this in a KET debate. I was invited as Republican into the primary debate. I kicked the boys' butts, okay? Mitch McConnell had millions in this race. Matt Bevin, who is now our governor, had millions. I came in third and I had a website, okay? I came in third behind those guys and, and advanced on the other individuals who were in that primary. When I went to that general debate, Mitch McConnell refused to debate unless they uninvited me, is what they did. They couldn't legally do it because they didn't have any criteria. So what they did, and I've got to tell you quick, is they began to make criteria to knock us out. I began to fight on my behalf and on um, the libertarian, uh, oh, our U.S. candidate, I fought on his behalf because I knew he was facing the same thing. And they did not let us in that debate. The Libertarian Party sued them, pulled their emails, and found that they were putting up their criteria to keep us out. The only way to beat them is to beat them in court. Johnson is doing the right thing. I'm planning on, because this is, this is criminal acts, what they're trying to do on 
um, doing a pro se lawsuit against the same individuals, <laughs> Johnson is just so that I can let them know we're not going to we're not going to stop. We're going to continue to fight you. We're going to keep doing this, and we're not going to let you put us down. We're going to get ourselves in the debate, however, whatever it's going to take. We're going to pursue that, and I that I'm going to rest my case with that. Thank you. I've often said, I, I'm not a you should do it this way libertarian, I'm a this is the way I do it libertarian. So I support everybody's efforts, I support every member of the libertarian party from the most radical anarchist abolitionist to the most pragmatic Rand Paul supporter. I appreciate every single uh, uh, contribution that everybody makes to this wonderful party. But I'm different, I look at things differently. For a libertarian to win the presidency will require a revolution. But revolutions happen. They always seem impossible before they happen, but inevitable afterwards. There's a limit to what we can do. The best we can do is be at the right time, at the right place, with the right message. It's not up to us. An election is not a contest. It's not a race. It's not how fast you run. It's not how many hours you put in. It's a decision. I'm a physician. I'm not here to compete. I'm just offering a second opinion. What we need to do <laughs> is we need to be there when the people's decision, because it's not up to us on this stage. It's up to the voters. But guess what? I think they are almost there. They've got, they've got, but it's not going to come from the. If it's not going to come from the Democrats, it's not going to come from the Republicans. It's not going to come from white middle-aged people like us. It's going to come from the Hispanics and the poor people and the blacks and the other of the hundred million people who have not been voting because they don't feel like they have any power and they don't think that we care about them. So we have to show it. But it's going to take a change. So how to do it? I'm not going to do it through hours of work. I think the way we do it is by leveraging what we could do. We need to do a voter registration program to send, to send our, our dedicated activists to the college campuses and to the parades and to the festivals all over this country and to get people to vote. We got to tell them. We believe in personal empowerment. If you feel that Hillary Clinton is the best for this country, then vote for that liar. If you think that Donald Trump is best, Thank vote you, for Doctor. that asshole. But if you disagree, you. then register your ass and vote. I want to thank all the candidates so far. We're going to go to our... Uh, yeah, Internet, yeah, thanks. And you guys Internet skipped me call. last time. Something really interesting has started happening. Is kind of the pattern that you can see over here is Governor Johnson just gets a mention, you know, every 10 seconds or so. He's just pretty solid and consistent all the way through. And it's basically been that way all week. Uh, Mr. McAfee gets mentions every time he starts speaking, and someone posts a picture of him with his shirt off, too. That's. <laughs> And, but something really interesting happened about 20 minutes ago for about 10 solid minutes. Uh, Austin Peterson just got a machine gun of mentions for, I don't exactly know why, but, and it lasted about 10 minutes and that's, and, and that's it. But it was, it was really impressive and it moved his light blue, if you look in the very tippity top corner, uh, just shot way up. So I thought that was totally interesting. And what, well, we're going to take a question from Twitter now? Let's could take a question. You, could you explain our little... Uh, Circle of dots over here. Yeah, so this is what? this is called the spider the spidey chart and this is like news me mainstream news media stories So what these inner dots represent are a mainstream media source Maybe the New York Times I could click into it and drill down and then these secondary are other outlets who picked up that story And then you move down further into the social media and where they're being shared uh, Beyond that we have the ability to drill down into these things, but we could do that later probably Thanks. We have, nope. we have two questions from Twitter um, for our uh, remaining two candidates. Individual questions for uh, Shauna Sterling and Austin Peterson. This one is for Pastor Sterling. Why should libertarian parents vote for you? Libertarian parents? Yes. Wow. I, I want to ask if there's more to that question. Um, 
Jeez, there's, there's so much that could be said. Um, when I was 12 years old, I started doing outreach in the inner city. And I pastored my uh, first church when, oh, back in 1998 to 2000. I, at that point, I was doing therapeutic foster care. And then, of course, I spent a couple years um, fighting corruption and adopting a little girl. And I have been working with children and families my entire life. So if there's anybody who can advocate for children and families and, and to do it um, for all races, that would, that would be me. There's a church in Houston, Texas. I don't, you know, go in church here, but it's called Brazewood. And I would go help out. They asked me to come in as an interim children's pastor. Well, their children are all um, multicultural. And I remember when I did that, when we were talking to the children's pastor, we had 200 plus kids. And so that was a mega church. So I love doing outreach in the Libertarian Party. I plan on doing outreach. And I'm available, whatever these families have. Um, I have a little more time. I wanted to say something. This, I'm taking some courses in military, I'm um, understanding military families. And I just thought about this the other day. But we, the Libertarian Party, has an awesome opportunity to reach out to military families. And the reason we do is because we have got all of these um, individual parties all over the states. And I don't know if you're, you're aware of this because this is brought on to me, but there's a lot of families, a lot of families in our military and our veterans that have, been, have come out and they're feeling isolated. And they just don't have, they're, they're, they're not able to blend back in. And I think if our party was able to take that into consideration and reach out to them, even do maybe a few events, I think that we could be a really awesome place for our military families and that could actually probably grow our party and help our party round it out. But I just, whatever they would need. People call me for counseling, I just do it, it's free. I do it free because in Kentucky, I'm considered a non-fee pastoral counselor. Thank you. And the last question is for Mr. Peterson. There's been a lot of talk about your personal manner. The most kindly of these statements being that you are off-putting or people say that you rub them the wrong way. How do you respond to these comments? What would you do, if anything, to adjust considering this feedback? It's amazing that a radical and an agitator is not accepted in his own land. <laughs> I am an agitator. I am here to make people uncomfortable. My job is to bring about change. I am a change agent. I am fighting for the future of this movement. I have been behind the scenes, sat behind, and watched too many failures. And I am a winner, and I have a winning attitude, and I will fight until the last man. I have an army of freedom ninjas in my back that, believe me, there are hundred, the hundreds and thousands of people that I brought here to watch tonight because they believe in me, because they believe that I'm the future of this movement. And if I'm making a few people uncomfortable, it's because I'm lighting fires under people's butts, because I want some people to get out there and campaign. Because if it's not going to be me that's at the top of the ticket, I guarantee you whoever the nominee may be is going to be a better man or woman because of my campaign. So I am here to fight and to bring about change. And, and you know what? Prophets are not always accepted in their own lands. And so if you do not like me, perhaps you do not like me because of my personality, but my message is pure, pure and clear. I am a child of the revolution. Uh, the revolution continues through AP for LP. The spirit of libertarianism resides in the campaign that I am pushing. And in the future, the country will be different and changed because of the army of freedom ninjas who are at my back, who are watching right now. I love you guys. Thank you. There are no big special interests guiding my campaign, funding me solely. I am totally funded by the grassroots. If you want someone who represents the broad swath of this libertarian movement, it is me. Come talk to me after it. Tell me after you have a conversation with me face to face if you don't like me. If I throw a few fists and a few elbows, well just think what I'm going to do to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, candidates, we're in kind of our last round. This is a speed round. Your responses are limited to 60 seconds. Okay. Um, and we will be alternating questions here. Um, first question is for Dr. Feldman. Um, when I was born, I was given three vaccinations. Today, a baby might be given 37 vaccinations before they're two. What is your medical opinion of the dangers of vaccination 
and what are your personal views on government mandated vaccinations? A, a very intelligent way of structuring the question into two parts, and I'll, I'll answer them both separately. One thing to understand is what vaccinations do is they stimulate an immune response. Every single human being is vaccinated by thousands and thousands of antigens just through our day-to-day -day activities. We're exposed to hundreds of viruses on a regular basis and we develop immune responses to that. So the reason why vaccination works is because it's not unnatural, it's just facilitating a process that is normal to human beings. Now. The problem is not that people don't trust the vaccinations. The problem is they don't trust their doctors with good reasons. Doctors have not done a good job of representing their people, of, of uh, too much uh, connection to the industry. So now the question is, uh, should we mandate vaccines? No, if 90% of people are vaccinated, that gives total, uh, uh, that's the best you can do. So what we need to do is have vaccinations, but, gov but no government mandate, thank you. My question is for Governor Johnson. Um, we've talked about owning our personal body, individual human rights. Um, we touched on right to life or pro-life, but we haven't really talked about the right to die. Can you please tell me your opinion on euthanasia? Is there a more fundamental right than being able to end your own life if you so chose to do that? So I guess that was it. That was a quick one. That was easy. Right on, right on. I love brevity. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, Mr. McAfee, uh, given your significant knowledge of computers, can you explain how the government could improve its ability to predict future terrorist attacks? I, I, well, it could fire all the current technologists in the government. I mean, our, our government, our government uh, is like uh, it, no one ever gets fired in the government. If you're incompetent, you are promoted. Such an environment does not promote creativity and innovation, which is what is needed here. Uh, there are algorithms, there are methodologies that could give us giant leaps. It would require totally restructuring our current technology offices. We would not need half as many people and we would need different kinds of people. Uh, this is why our government is so far behind the rest of the world. Uh, it is bureaucratic, it is stagnant, uh, and managed by sick, tired, old people. Thank you. All right, this one is for Mr. Peterson. From one youngish person to another youngish person. Um, that's been a topic people have talked about a lot with your campaign. The traditional route to the pres presidency usually involves beginning governmental service and then working your way up through the Congress or state level. So you're going around that route. I'm curious as to why running for president and why now? At the end of last year, I was desperate and I saw ourselves bereft of leadership, of someone who would stand strong and carry the torch of libertarianism, pure, clear, honest, with integrity, and I will lift up the sword of righteousness to the American people and remind them of our constitutional republic and what it means. Now, not all public service is the same, but I've served my country and I've served this party and I've done it for many years. Now, I've not been successful as a Republican. I've been successful as a libertarian. That's an important difference. That's an important difference. I'm not a carpetbagger. I've built this party. Now, I think that I could bring us forward. And listen, lots of, don't, don't hate me because I'm young and pretty. Um, the truth is, is that our country was founded by young people. And if you saw the Stossel debate, you'll, you would realize the truth is, is that on July 4th, 1776, the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson was 33. Alexander Hamilton was 21. James Madison was 25. The Marquis de Lafayette was 18 years old. Young people founded this country, and young people will restore it. I promise you that. Thank you. Pastor Sterling, um, Americans have developed a uh, 
reflexive fear of Muslims in general and Sharia law in particular. Is there a way for us to respect other forms of religious expression while still protecting our American way of life? I had, um, I got accepted into seminary and I actually, and I actually chose not to go. I did my religious studies at the University of Arizona. And I think that was an excellent choice because in that degree, I got to study Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And we, we have a lot of uh, Muslims, a lot of individuals who follow Islam in our country. And they do that from the goodness of their heart, from what is good in their faith. Unfortunately, ISIS has taken extremes of a religion and has played off of it and really has been a horrendous attack against um, Islam and against the Muslim people. One of the things that I'm very proud of, and um, you won't see this a lot on the internet, but um, I have been working behind the scenes to support our special forces and the role they played with the Kurds. I was one of the early ones who said, arm the Kurds, and they are Muslim. And they have been, since I was one of the first ones that said it, they gave them that money. And I'm telling you, they have been fighting ISIS and they have been taking back these cities. So it's just having an open heart and realizing that there's not just extremity in Muslim, in Islam, but also there could be extreme individuals in any religion. Thank you very much. All right, let's do one more question um, for Mr. Feldman, or Dr. Feldman, excuse me, Dr. Feldman. So as a doctor, how do you feel that this gives you the experience or contributes to your qualifications to be president? Mostly because of my experience with human beings. Once, I'll tell you, once you've seen human beings from the inside, you realize how similar we all are. We really have a lot more in common than we have different. I'm probably the only person here who's seen abortions up close and personal and seen how brutal they are, as well as probably the only person who's taken care of a woman who's been the victim of an illegal abortion and seen how horrible and terrible that is as well. I can tell you that I've seen a lot of death, and it makes you appreciate life, but it also takes away fear, and fear is a method of control. Once you fear, people can control you, and you'll hear fear up here. John McAfee is afraid of a cyber attack. Gary Johnson has said he's afraid of, uh, of Sharia law. Austin Peterson is afraid of Gary Johnson. <laughs> I'm not afraid of a damn thing. Thank you. Governor Johnson. Uh, the Libertarian Party was officially formed on December 14th, 1971 in Colorado. In 1972, John Hospers and Tony Nathan, our Libertarian presidential and vice presidential candidates, respectively, were on the ballot in three states, yet they earned the party's first two electoral votes. What has the party accomplished since then, and what do you predict for the Libertarian Party in the future? I think we have the opportunity, and, and I would not be doing this if there if there weren't the opportunity of winning. I, I wouldn't be doing this if that opportunity didn't exist. And in this election, how do you set the table any better than what it's set? You've got Donald Trump is gonna be the nominee, Hillary Clinton is gonna be the nominee. These are the two most polarizing figures in all American politics. Um, look, I think that the vast, Amer uh, the vast majority of Americans are libertarians. Uh, they just don't know it. And the table is set such that people are going to actually know it. I bring up the website, isidewith.com. For everybody here, get online. Take the 36 questions in this political quiz. Tell your friends to take this quiz. In 2012, I was the next president of the United States based on being in line with what most people think. Well, that's libertarian, and that's the opportunity, and let's be thinking win here in November. 
Thank you. Mr. McAfee. I have a question for you, Mr. McAfee. So when we look at the government, we hear a lot about asset forfeiture, all kinds of government corruption, government gone um, out of control in many ways. So as president, what would you do to rein in corruption in the government? In order to rein in any corruption in any system or even in any individual, you have to first rein in their power. This is just a fundamental truth of life. As governments grow, they get more powerful. And governments are composed of individuals, and all of our weaknesses are expressed through governments and magnified. When individuals become angry, a bloody nose happens. When governments become angry, entire nations are wiped out. When individuals become greedy, we don't invite them to dinner anymore. When governments become greedy, People starve. Entire nations starve. So to, to stamp out corruption, we first have to understand the connection to power and remove the power from the government, for heaven's sake. Thank you. Hey, Austin, I'd like you to define the universe and give three examples, please. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> My real question is a little tougher. I wore a white shirt and tie for all eight years of grade school. Now, children buy blue jeans with holes already in them. Many of our children graduate from high school functionally illiterate, and they have no significant grasp of history. How are young people going to help us restore liberty if they can't look away from their iPhones long enough to cross the street? Well, first of all, first of all, technology frees us all. Technology is freeing people in other nations. We, let's get out of our American bias here. There's a revolution going on in Brazil right now. And do you know how old the leader of that revolution is, that young libertarian? He's 21 years old. And he's doing it with his iPhone. So don't tell me that young people can't bring about change in this country, because we can. And don't tell me that we don't love our country because we wear blue jeans, because we're a hell of a lot cooler than our parents ever were. And our music is better, too. <laughs> Listen, we started at the bottom, now we're here. Young people are gonna lead this country back <laughs> to a limited government and we're gonna do it with our phones. You know, how am I competing with these front runners? You know how I'm doing it? I'm doing it with my iPhone right now. They're donating, they're spreading the word. The revolution continues. So you know, I don't have much time, come talk to me afterwards. I could tell you incredible stories about my, my life and my journey as a libertarian. And I guarantee you that if you put me at the top of your ticket, you will be proud to be a libertarian. And the young people will come and they will flock to our banner because liberty unites us it doesn't divide us and some old people can come along too if they want mm -hmm. but just john only john's allowed to come along <laughs> only john's allowed to come along well he's, he's, cool. he's you know, john's cool so yeah, I, I thought he was well, i thought he was texting women this whole time <laughs> All right um last question is for you shauna um as a pastor as the president how would you encourage and continue to keep church and state separate? Hey, <laughs> you guys are gonna clap for it. Do you want me? To, I'll go ahead and speak. Um, this is this is the thing. The Constitution is very clear on this. We have the religious rights. It doesn't matter how we want to worship, where we want to worship, when we want to worship. That is our rights, and the U.S. government cannot cannot take that right away from us. Now, as far as religious oh, crosses or religious uh, different things that are special to religions, you never know what someone might think is special. They might want to put it on a government building or put a picture up or something. I honestly believe that the federal government, pursuant to our U.S. Constitution, they have no right to limit them. It is up to the governments, the states, the states, and the people to decide what they want to put up. So the federal government needs to stay out, and then they also should not violate any of the religious rights of our people. As long as your religious right doesn't tell you, your God doesn't tell you to go kill an American citizen, then that's, that's not a religion that, that we protect.
everybody can take a deep breath. We've come to the end of our questions. We have your closing statements. You have two minutes to summarize your campaign and make your last appeal to the, the delegates and the voters. Again, we'll go in uh, original order. Dr. Feldman. Well, as I said, is uh, I think we have to try a lot of different things. We have to try our message in, in different ways to find out what resonates. Because it used to be that the medium was the message. Today, the message has become the medium. A uh, fellow can take a video of his little kid in the back seat after the dentist all stoned out and get 150 million people all over the world can see it without a dollar of promotion. So uh, I'm going to try poetry. So Break These Chains and Fly by Mark Feldman. I'm Mark Allen Feldman. I'm an Ohio resident. I'm telling you why I'm running for president. I'm getting old, but I'm still bold. I got no fear because my blood runs cold. I'm never bought and I'll never get sold. My answers were slave too. That's why I can represent you because I'm a libertarian Jew. Republicans and Democrats are whack. They spend billions of dollars just to attack. We've been slaves and we're not going back. Libertarians are fresh and dope. We don't care who you marry, what you carry, or what you smoke. So give a libertarian your vote because billionaires will never care for a country that's broke. They say you have to flash the cash to make a splash. They promise you everything, then dine and dash. I don't buy it, and I won't try it. The government's too fat, let's put it on a diet. The bureaucracy's supposed to work for us. They promised all the pork for us, but they don't do squat for us. No more oppression or deep depression, no apologies and no confessions. A time of defiance and self-reliance. They think we're small, but we're like giants. We may lose, but before we die, we gotta break these chains and fly. Poor education that's humiliation, discrimination, and brutalization. Inflation and taxation bring inner city evacuation. Dislocation, stagnation, and mass incarceration. And most welfare is for the corporations. These are the 10 plagues that affect our nation. John F. Kennedy had the remedy till he was killed by the enemy. The assassinations rocked our nation, started terrible conflagration. But he hadn't lied when he prophesied, because what he said was simply incredible. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Thank you, doctor. Aw, they're hugging it out. <laughs> I got goosebumps all over my arms right now. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this as gently as I can. If you want to see another Stossel debate, then then go ahead and put your tokens in for these three candidates. When it comes to our meeting in Orlando, Florida, these guys they've got they've got people campaigning for them already. Some of their trips are paid for. They're gonna get those 30 delegates. They're, they're going to get them. Austin will get them. McAfee, he's popular. He'll get them. Johnson's got them all ready to go. But some of these other candidates up here, like Dr. Feldman and like myself, we need, we need, these, we need, we need to, you guys to have some faith in us. Get us on that debate. Get us in the debate. Unless you want to just see the same three candidates, get us in the debate. Give us a chance. Don't you want to see what we got to offer? Give us a chance and we will fight for the LP party and we will go ahead and give, um, take it as far as we can go. So we need your help. Please remember that. Remember our names and help us get into that debate. I, I need you guys, I really do, okay? Stossel actually reached out uh, for um, um, our response or our input on these debates, and um, my input was, is include more libertarian candidates in the debate. That was my response. There is a general election that's going to follow the nomination for the libertarian candidate. Um, New Mexico has the highest percentage Hispanic population of any state in the United States. I've been asked repeatedly, how did you reach out and get the Hispanic vote? I didn't do anything to get the Hispanic vote. 
What I say here is the same thing I say before every audience, and I will have to tell you that it resonates with every single audience. Um, I don't believe that a third party can get elected without being in the presidential debates. We have the opportunity of being in the presidential debates, and whomever you nominate has the opportunity to spread this message. I also want you to know that experience does count. So I was very disappointed with the results in 2012. I thought that they would have been a lot higher. But I have to tell you that right now, we're not starting off where we left off. We're much further along than where we left off. This is an historic opportunity to change politics in America and to see something that has never, ever happened before, but it's got the opportunity right now. I ask you for the nomination, and I pledge to you, none of you will be disappointed with the work ethic that will go along with making a victory possible. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a rendezvous with destiny. And we can decide whether or not we will try what we've tried before, or if we'll try something new. I believe that I'm the only candidate on this stage who can put together a broad national coalition of libertarians, conservatives, reasonable Democrats, and independents to win. There are conservatives who are reaching out to us, to our campaign, people who who have uh, run fleeing from the GOP specifically because they had, the only problem that they had with the Libertarian was that they weren't pro-life. So on a national stage, while this might harm me in my primary, this is very good for us in the general election, and this will allow us to build a much larger coalition of these conservatives who will not support Donald Trump. When it comes to those reasonable Democrats, I have advocated for a full end to the war on drugs. I have advocated for a full end to crony capitalism. I would never, ever, ever force someone to bake a cake for someone they don't believe in because I believe in religious freedom. The, the issues of monopoly and of economics are that they bear out towards the libertarian viewpoint. If you want the United States to be a freer, more prosperous country, then you have to argue for libertarian economics because the laws of supply and demand will catch up with you. I am steeped in the arcane lore of libertarianism. I will bring the message of Mises to the masses. I love Mises to pieces. <laughs> and I consider myself very much a Hayekian of spontaneous order. I am a warrior for this cause. We don't come around very often, the liberty champions. But when we do, I hope that you will understand that the abrasiveness that you might see is not out of a disdain for my fellow man. It is out of a, out of a fear of a loss of liberty. And so I'm fighting for our cause now. And I ask for your vote and your support at the National Convention in Orlando. I will make you proud to be a libertarian, and I will bring you a victory, because I've been winning every day for the last 10 years, and I'll keep on winning for you. So please vote for me. Thank you. <laughs> the older I get, the less I know. But I do know this, that every prerequisite we set for ourselves for success is merely a barrier to that success, and it will become an excuse when we fail. This is the fact. There is only one prerequisite for us here and now, and that is conviction. Conviction. Not just belief, but conviction, that thing that grows from your heart, which you know is true and manifests itself in the world. What creates a revolutionary? What separates a revolutionary from the average citizen? It is conviction. That thing that makes you stand up to impossible odds and take any suffering that comes because you have a duty to yourself and to your children and to everyone in this society. Everyone. Everyone. I'm not asking you to, to go in and out of jail with me. Jail is not for everyone. 
It's an acquired taste. <laughs> but, but if you have conviction in these simple, beautiful, magical things, the precepts of this party, then please, those of you who go out and get voter registrations, God bless you. God bless you. That is what gives the party this power. We need nothing else but access and our hearts and the conviction that we are doing right. Again, it is for your children. It is for your children because when you do not stand up, when you're afraid, then you have put that fear and that burden on your child. You do not have that right. We do not have that right. Thank you. Wow. Wow. I've been, been back following Twitter, guys. If you're not following, this is unbelievable. You have to see what some of these tweets are saying, that this is what a debate is supposed to be like. Well, you guys just schooled everybody on how this is supposed to be done. Thank you very much. All right. I, I want to certainly thank our candidates one more time, Dr. Feldman, Pastor Sterling, Governor Johnson, Mr. Peterson, and Mr. McAfee.